1950, as the dawn of a new decade began, so did the nation's rush to bring an exciting new form of entertainment into their living rooms. Television. As more and more rooftops began to sprout TV antennas, the entertainment once found only in movie theaters made its way into America's living rooms. There were westerns. Grouch. Stanley Grouch. Comedies. Stanley Grouch. <laughs> Dramas. Sporting events. Gallardo is in real trouble. Cops and robber programs. Ragged squad. And of course, science fiction. Well, all safe and ship shape. A good number of science fiction oriented programs were aimed at a juvenile audience. Saturday mornings were dominated by the high tech exploits of Tom Corbett's Space Cadet, Captain Video, Space Patrol, and Rocky Jones, Space Ranger. Check three o'clock, Rocky. I think there's a meteor pack bearing down on us. Climb over, sir. Not a chance, Rocky. Take a 90 degree port turn. We'll ride along with it. Our right, port, sir. The adventures of Flash Gordon made its way to the airwaves in 1953. I don't understand it. First Isis, then Osiris. Mithra and Baca shattering in space. It's weird, Doctor. Crazy. Four planets blowing up in rapid succession. Why? Why should that happen? It seems to be some mysterious atomic force, Flash. Possibly a chain reaction operating from some central source. Well, it's about the last of the chain, Doctor. There's only one dead planet left, and that's Minerva. And there it is. Dead ahead. The out-of-this-world science fiction programs came down to Earth as the finely crafted science fiction anthology, Science Fiction Theater, debuted. Hosted by Truman Bradley, the series presented some of the most imaginative science and speculative fiction stories to emerge in the 1950s. But the program which has endured and is possibly the favorite of most 1950s science fiction fans is Superman. From 1953 through 1957, The Exploits of the Man of Steel was a program not to be missed. Superman sponsors were quick to capitalize on the television hero's ability to sell their products. Every place I go, I see that favorite new cereal of mine, Kellogg Sugar Frosted Flakes. Look. You just can't be Superman, and that's all there is to it. Why not? Well, for one thing, you're a girl. And that's not much of a reason. Well, I know something you can do that Superman will sure like. Why? You can have some more Kellogg Sugar Frosted Flakes. Superman says they're the best. I like them the best, too. Hey, I know. Since you like sugar frosted flakes, you can be Supergirl. <laughs> you see, kids may argue, but never about Kellogg's sugar frosted flakes. The face of science fiction television changed somewhat at the close of the decade, as more sophisticated and adult anthologies debuted in 1959. The Twilight Zone was hosted by author Rod Serling. The weekly anthology leaned heavily upon science fiction-themed episodes. During the series' successful five-year run, a host of robots, alien invaders, and futuristic inventions were introduced to viewers. Making its debut the same year as Twilight Zone was one step beyond. This series commingled reports of psychic phenomenon with dashes of science fiction. This is important. I warned you what would happen if you kept pushing yourself. Now I'm going to have to put in a report to the front office that you're no longer fit. It's for your own protection. I should have done it months ago. I'm sorry, Alex. But I have to do it. If you take care of yourself, proper diet, proper rest, or you can live as long as anyone else, and even come back to work eventually. 
you don't, you'll be dead within six months. You're wrong. I only wish I were, Alex. Look. You take this envelope back to your own doctor. Have him get in touch with me. I'll only be too You're glad. wrong. I don't have six months. I don't have six days. I'll be dead by tonight. Well, Alex, it's true your condition is serious, but not that. When I was standing there at that wheel, it was like a million colored lights exploding in my head. That's symptomatic of a stroke. No. Suddenly, I knew I was going to die. Doesn't matter what I do. I'll be dead by tonight. I know it. While One Step Beyond dealt with the more intellectual aspects of science fiction, the fans of science fiction at its wildest were gifted with the space creature infested series, The Outer Limits. Complex creature makeups and special photographic effects were a highlight of most episodes. The popularity of the program helped usher in a series of science fiction TV shows by one of the most prolific producers of the science fiction genre, Irwin Allen. During Irwin Allen's reign at 20th Century Fox, the imaginative producer brought a number of programs drenched in science fiction. His production of the Time Tunnel followed the adventures of two scientists who were lost in the mechanics of a time travel device, traveling at random and finding themselves at such historic sites as the Alamo and on board the Titanic. Allen cast Richard Basehart in the role of Admiral Nelson in the television incarnation of his successful feature film, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. For three years, the crew of the atomic submarine Seaview were menaced by undersea monsters, dinosaurs, underwater visitors from space, and several ghosts with an adhesion to the sea. Another Allen classic was Lost in Space, starring Guy Williams and June Lockhart. The series recounted the adventures of a family who were to begin colonizing outer space, but when their spacecraft is sabotaged and thrown off course, they're destined to journey from planet to planet, dealing with multitudes of space inhabitants. While Irwin Allen Productions was transforming 20th Century Fox Studios into a science fiction program assembly line, another program quietly began filming at the studio, one which would ultimately become the most popular science fiction program on the air, Batman. Comic book heroes Batman and Robin, with their futuristic car, the Batmobile, and an amazing assortment of crime-fighting accessories, became a pop phenomenon in 1966. Waddle Canal, Batman. What now? What now? Why, everything's new as Batman and Robin battle crime with a battery of wonderful new bat novations. The Batcopter. The Batboat. The Batcycle. And Flash, a late bulletin from the Cape. Three, two, one. The Bat Rocket blasting off. Adam West starred in the title role as Batman with novice actor Burt Ward appearing as Robin. Monitoring crime from their high-tech secret underground laboratory, the Batcave, the dynamic duo, as they were to become known, would immediately mobilize when summoned by the police chief. Crime ran rampant in their fictitious Gotham City. The warped villains on the series had a true love for crime. They reveled in their villainy. Wonderfully overplaying their roles, the villains had many viewers cheering them on. See the dynamic duo dangle from new heights of danger. Careful, Robin, it's quite a drop. See them batter their way through new bat ventures with old friends. Correction, fiends. Holy dark ten yet. I'm not just pussyfooting around this time, Batman. <laughs> week after week, the Cape Crusader copes with the tricky traps of vicious villains. Will the time arrive when the Cape crime fighters come too close to the jaws of death? Holy metronome, what a fate. Punched in the player piano rolls. Meet their wild, weird new Batversaries, the archest criminals of all time. Batman's ever colorful array of adversaries read like a Hollywood who's who. Most notably, there was Frank Gorshin as the Riddler, a maniacal villain who taunted Batman and Robin by leaving cryptic clues foreshadowing his latent crime. Veteran performer Cesar Romero appeared frequently as the Joker. This villain's wild pranks usually meant life-threatening problems for Batman and Robin. The Penguin was played by Burgess Meredith. The Penguin kept a foul gang ever near to do his evil bidding. The Catwoman. Julie Newmar was the long-legged sexy nemesis who many suspected had romantic inclinations towards the Cape Crusader. 
In addition to these regular villains, many other major stars appeared as guest villains, such as George Sanders as Mr. Freeze, David Wayne as the Mad Hatter, Victor Bono as King Tut, Roddy McDowell as the Bookworm, Art Carney as the Archer, and Vincent Price as Egghead. With an ever-mounting number of adversaries, the dynamic duo soon became the terrific trio. In his third season, Batgirl joined the crusade against crime. Fear not, America. They are still on duty. That legendary duo still humbly withholding their true identity under the guises of a noble flying rodent and a commonplace backyard bird. To the Batmobile! But what's this? That's no tricycle, citizen. Holy femininity. Batgirl. Batgirl? 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 Happens on. Built and splat. What reassurance in those sounds. Well, the dynamic duo now becomes the tremendous trio. But even the welcome addition of beautiful Yvonne Craig couldn't save the Batman series from being canceled at the conclusion of its third year. Of all the stars ever to shine on the televised science fiction horizon, the brightest was a creation of producer Gene Roddenberry called Star Trek. The premise was simple, a spacecraft exploring the heavens, providing the background for three seasons of thought-provoking episodes. The series starred William Shatner as Captain Kirk, commander of the starship Enterprise. Leonard Nimoy as science officer Spock, and DeForest Kelly as the ship's chief medical officer, Dr. McCoy. Typical episodes dealt with an array of wonders the crew members encountered while on its peaceful mission of space exploration. What we are about to see is a privileged glimpse behind the scenes, a rare assembly of outtakes from the series. At the conclusion of each season's filming, the show's film editors would compile a reel of the funniest bloopers captured on film. Copies would then be distributed to cast and crew members as souvenirs. As what you are watching was literally rescued from the editing room floor, the overall quality of these outtakes will vary at times. However, the rarity and hilarity of these rare clips more than compensates for a few technical flaws. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, Due to circumstances beyond our control, the program originally scheduled for this time will not be presented. We will instead bring to you, direct from the Venice Film Festival, Star Trek Behind the Scenes, starring William Shatner as Captain James Kirk, commander of the Starship Enterprise. God damn! Courageous champion of the universe. <laughs> You don't want to tell me what I know. I'll kiss you. <clears throat> Defender of female virtue. <laughs> Loved by all. Envied by some. A true hero of the world of tomorrow, Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock, loyal first officer of the Enterprise. Logical. What makes you think you're a man? You're an overgrown jackrabbit. An elf with a hyperactive thyroid. Unemotional. Super intellect, the plants act as a suppository. <laughs> Unable to lose self-control under any circumstances. <laughs> Forrest Kelly as Dr. McCoy, dedicated to his profession. Understanding. A well-adjusted man. Promoter of physical fitness. Well, girls, I suppose you can turn up something. And our supporting players, the Monsters. Major! 
Not least, the girls. He thinks the public needs it. The tenant put B deck on audio. If you say so, Mr. Spark Sugar. <laughs> Doctor, may I speak to you for a moment, please? Of course. Well, I know this is going to sound foolish, but I feel like hell. I forgot. What did I say? And now to our story. Captain's log, star date. Uh, Dr. Layton was murdered while the critic. <coughs> <laughs> Mr. Spack. <laughs> Message from e mini R7, Captain. Are you uh, Bill? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Funny cap. Do you think it would cause a breakdown of discipline if the lowly lieutenant kissed the star of a ship captain? <laughs> Listen about that bacon. No, really. Save it, please. Lieutenant, notify Starfleet as to us. Go. Lieutenant, notify. <laughs> Enterprise calling Starbase 6. Come in, Starbase 6. Starbase 6, here. Hi, y'all, sugar. Don't cut. Don't cut. Bob Jasper, I'm going home now. I'm going to spend three hours on the makeup table. Putting this makeup back on. And it's your fault. Think positively. Spark to Enterprise. Spark to Enterprise. Come in, Enterprise. Enterprise, Lieutenant Uhura. <laughs> <laughs> This here is a heater, boss. I don't know what this thing is. Cut, okay. Save it, Damn, 
Indian. If they refuse to move out on cue, screw them. <laughs> Save it, please. <laughs> I want you to know in the rushes, All I am right. doing this shot under protest. Would you like to do it again? <laughs> Don't anybody move. position. We're locked onto your coordinates. We are prepared to beam you aboard. Captain, you forgot all about the environment and all that stuff. Do you want to really do that? <laughs> David. Are you all right? You sound tired. <sighs> Acknowledge, Captain. Is everything all right? Okay. <sighs> Somebody help the Captain! May our five-year mission expand to ten, and the gallant crew retain their nobility as the royalty of the final frontier. <laughs> Ahead, walk back to one. Following the third season of Star Trek, the series was canceled. However, in the minds of multitudes of Star Trek's followers, the series could not die. Fans of Star Trek mounted letter-writing campaigns to the network demanding the program be returned to the air. While their efforts failed to renew NBC's interest in the series, the letters did demonstrate that there was enough interest in the program to spin off a theatrical motion picture based on the television series. Thus, Star Trek The Motion Picture was produced and led to a successful and diverse series of Star Trek films. 
Inspired by the initial television success of Star Trek, a number of intellectual science fiction series debuted. The Invaders cast Roy Thinnes as a man who witnesses the landing of a spacecraft. The aliens take on human form in an attempt to infiltrate, then conquer Earth. Another thought-provoking series which attained cult status was The Prisoner. The 17 episodes of the series focused on Patrick McGowan's efforts to escape the mysterious village where he's held a prisoner. In 1974, Darren McGavin starred as an unlikely hero of Kolchak, the Night Stalker. Portraying a reporter working at a fictitious Chicago-based newspaper, the character Carl Kochak would encounter a different monster in each episode. The series was developed for television following the astonishing success of a movie of the week, also entitled The Night Stalker, which claimed the highest ratings ever achieved by a telefilm prior to its debut in 1972. Unfortunately for Kolchak fans, the TV series did not meet with the same success and was canceled following 20 episodes. Another popular series inspired by a made-for-TV movie was Night Gallery. This anthology series blended elements of horror and science fiction tales to arrive at the unique concept of presenting two or three different stories per installment. The series marked the welcome return of Rod Serling to television. As he did years earlier with Twilight Zone, Serling would introduce the various playlets. The next 15 years saw a smattering of attempts by television to revitalize interest and the science fiction genre series. In The Six Million Dollar Man, Lee Majors portrays a U.S. astronaut who survives a devastating crash. His life is saved by replacing damaged body parts with electromechanical devices. Thus he becomes a cyborg, partially human and part machine. As the series developed, Lindsay Wagner was introduced as a love interest. Her character suffered a similar fate and a bionic woman was created. She later spun off into a program of her own the Bionic Woman. Other series at the close of the 1970s were rooted deeper in classic science fiction. Logan's Run took place in the year 2319 and dealt with a society where no one was permitted to live beyond their 30th birthday. Gregory Harrison starred as the fleeing 30-year-old Logan. Battlestar Galactica, also set in the distant future, featured Lauren Green as the commander of the Galactica the pride of a fighter squadron of spacecraft combating the forces of evil in outer space. In Buck Rogers in the 25th century, Gil Gerard starred as the pilot of a spacecraft cruising through the galaxies after having been frozen in suspended animation for 500 years. With the debut of Buck Rogers, veteran television viewers had come full circle. 30 years earlier, a more primitive version of Buck Rogers was among the first programs to illuminate America's living rooms in April of 1950. And as television producers reached back to the classic programs for general guidance and reference, we were assured that for countless television seasons to come, we would see the shadows of the classic science fiction programs of television's glorious past influencing newer productions. Programs such as Wonder Woman and The Incredible Hulk were heavily influenced by superheroes of an earlier era. The high-tech gadgets in series such as Knight Rider were foreshadowed by similar devices 40 years earlier on science fiction theater. And as we move into the final decade of the 20th century, viewers are enjoying an all new version of one of America's most beloved programs. Star Trek The Next Generation continues the imaginative saga that has become a cornerstone in the history of science fiction.